Hello, my name is Joshua, and first and foremost, I'd like to say thank you for viewing this video and subsequently visiting my channel. The topic of this video is going to be on being creative, um, and it's going to be another discussion about creativity because I noticed that most of my viewers are interested in philosophy, psychology, and um, those topics because those are the ones that I've um, brought up so far at least most consistently, and um, I just recently made a video on creative ideation, but something I was thinking about because of that video is when um, you're thinking about being creative in general, what's the roadmap? Like, how do you know what to participate in as a person um, that, you know, you're, that you would actually be successful and creative in? And uh, that's what I want to talk about now. I think that um, I've talked about sufficiently in other videos that really creativity does come down to temperamental variances that just really make it something of a comedic or tragic story in the sense that not everybody's going to be creative and you pretty much have to have a certain amount of trait openness to experience a part of your character or you can just forget trying to keep up with the creative types in the world because if you're not open the creative types they are open so whether or not they want to have ideas and whether or not they're seeking to differentiate themselves and having certain experiences in the world volitionally that is intentionally it is just a part of their mo so by the time you have an open person who's uh even so I can tell you the amount of information. So people are always surprised about the amount of things that I know because, I mean, I'm not over the ages. I'm I'm just now approaching the ages of 30. And, um, and so um, when people are, you know, when I was 13 and 15, I still, people were still impressed with the amount of information I knew as a person and the things that I would talk about, much more of the things that I knew and much more of the things that I talked about would fall within the wheelhouse of things that somebody heard tangentially or they know somebody who's talked about this before or they've heard these things before or um, there's an, an, but you know, a lot of still, there's a lot of surprise for people because you know, I'm 13, 15 years old. What are you, what are you a 13 and 15 year old person doing, knowing about Freud and Socrates and all these other things because that's not what anybody's that's not what I was taught in school so uh, why were you looking at these things and I don't come from a philosophical family or educational background or family with a very steep educational background so how is it that I'm the person that I'm that I am and there, a lot of it has to do with the fact that I read the right uh, people at the right times and uh, various stages of development in my life that um, turned out to be very fortuitous to me because I wouldn't say that um, I did really very much other than be a um, thinking, hyper-exploratory sort of individual. So I, I think and I analyze things. I'm very deductive and logical, and then I'm hyper-exploratory. I mess around with things, and I play with things all the time. So that's what I, those are the things that I generally do. So I wind up consuming a lot of information and um, racking up a lot of experiences, either virtual or real. Um, you can even think about reading a book as an experience, so whether or watching uh, YouTube videos or um, going out to the pub or going and playing in front of a group of people or going to an open mic night, whatever those things i've I've been in part of impromptu course classes and things like that at various points in times in my life. And so those things they stack up and that's the accumulation of experiences and no matter whether those experiences happen in a virtual way or in some real world at hand way, uh, virtual in the sense that um, you do not, when you're reading a story, you're not actually on a lost island with a bunch of boys who are rowdy and murderous towards one another. I'm just refer referencing uh, Lord of the Flies, but whenever I read that story, I could visualize everything that was going on and I could think about all of the narratives and the philosophical tropes that were underneath and behind it and I wrote actually a few different um, kind of passages or uh, short essays on the relevance between the symbolism in the Lord of the Flies and 
um, it's comments on human nature and how these things stem not only from um, a biblical tradition, but more of a Greek tragic view of humanity um, and that um, within recent, um, I guess, like within the Christianization and the industrialization of the world and the hyper optimism that came um, on the tips of these things that we have since moved away from. It's something that's even true when you're looking at contemporary politics or you're talking to most progressive types or even, I mean, I think conservative types, well, even conservatives. I mean, uh, the American landscape is very uh, optimistic. It's extremely optimistic about human nature, human capacity, and human potential. It just does not really want to embrace the tragic view of existence, which I think, you know, that's another video for another um, topic. But the thing I'm trying to illustrate is, like, look at all the dang things that I think about or see and talk about or read or experience. So did I intentionally have a certain plan in doing these things? No. By the time I... Uh, when I left home and I had to organize myself as a person in order to be successful in life and, you know, to try and have a job and make it for myself in the world and be responsible for myself, that's when I started organizing myself. That's when I started having intentionality behind my activity. But that didn't happen until I was like 20, 21 years old. So, but there's 20, there's about 20 years of me just being an open individual. And I found very, even when I stepped into my um, introductory courses at the community college I was attending, when I, I stepped into an English class, uh, my reading had far exceeded the reading of my classmates. And um, I know it was a community college, so it was not a very high entry barrier, but I figured because this was a college writing course um, that since this is a collegiate level course, you would figure that um, most of these people have read Chaucer or, or at least tried to read Chaucer or maybe they've heard of Stendhal or maybe they've heard of Ibsen or maybe they've read uh, Mid Num Midnight Summer's Dream or any of these things because I had a certain idea of uh, literature. So in my uh, educational experience, um, we read contemporary literature, but we read mostly what people would colloquially consider the Western canon or some of the greatest Western novels written of all time. Um, this would include everything from Shakespeare to The Great Gatsby to um, to, kill, to Kill a Mockingbird, and, um, and Their Eyes Were Watching God by Zora Neale Hurston, and um, Macbeth, and Hamlet, um, and I can't remember what else, but... That's pretty much what um, I thought of reading. I thought to read um, books, that's that's what you're doing. And then I learned um, by entering um, a Barnes and Noble that um, when I was 16 or 17, um, that I just got uh, established or built in Houston, in Houston. Um, that there were philosophy texts and that I could read Socrates. Now, people talk about Socrates, but does anybody, do people really read Plato's um, dia so Socratic dialogues? And so I read a few, a few uh, Socratic dialogues, and I read The Trial and the Death of Socrates all by the time I was 19 years old. So you got to know that I was a little arrogant at the time, too, because I'm I don't really know much, but I'm a kid with a head full of knowledge. But at the same time, I'm hyper-exploratory, and it's that hyper-exploratory nature that got all of that knowledge in my mind in the first place. And so that's why I say, if you're not open, don't try. Because, well, yeah, that may sound defeatist or pessimistic or whatever. So, I mean, there's a division of labor and creative industry and things like that. I guess I suppose I'm more of like a purist in the sense that I think that creative people don't have very many things that are for them that they would really excel in or that um, 
they're going to have the opportunity to really catalyze an identity and um, catalyze an identity that they see as worthwhile or that is uh, beneficial to other people. And I think that creative uh, industries and um, creative um, creative industries and creative Anyways, I don't know. Anyways, um, but yeah, creative industries have to exist for these reasons because they're not very many things for creative people in the first place. So that's why I take the stance that I take. I'm not saying if you're, well, so I'm talking to open people. So this is why I'm talking to open people because open people to me are the real creative people and so open people. So if your life sounds even kind of, maybe it doesn't have to be as steeped in like as much education, but you know, you know if you're the type that goes on collecting really strange novel or interesting experiences um, most people haven't done very haven't done very many things like most people haven't acted in a play most people have not written a, a short story or a set of short stories most people have not written like poems most people do not do things like this just generally actually Funnily enough, you know, it took me a very long time to accept or realize these things, but that's just the truth. And the reason why most people don't do it, because it takes a certain personality in the first place to have sort of the proclivity to move towards those things in the first place. Um, and it also, I think, uh, requires a certain dimension of personality that would um, depose somebody to sit down and do something like that. So I also tend to think that introverts um, or people who are moderate in extroversion. I don't tend to think that... The reason why I don't think that the most extroverted and the most open people are going to be the most creative people is because the most creative people have a certain combination between breadth and depth of knowledge. And it's not really a particular algorithm, but a... a uh, proportionality that maintains itself across all creative people highly highly creative people's work so creative work that uh, is known to creative people within certain domains to relative um, degrees of fame or success it doesn't have to be the most famous or successful thing but you know to actually get something published in mathematics is a big deal there's a very big entry barrier similar to actually so Modern technology has made it easier and easier and easier for people to put their music out into the world. But at the same time, there are still sufficiently high barriers to get your music to be heard or you to be endorsed by other musicians from a, a more broader uh, referential standpoint. I mean, there are... Uh, musicians here on YouTube that I know about and I know about them mostly through YouTube and through YouTube I find them on Spotify then there are musicians that I found on Spotify that um, and a lot of people know and then the ones that a lot of people don't know um, I listen to lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of music and I'm going to tell you that probably a lot of the music that I listen to, most people don't know about it. Most people haven't heard these sorts of, heard these songs or heard these bands. And the reason why I know them, the reason why I've heard them is because I've spent time around other musicians. I've gone exploring for more new music. And I am a musician within um, folk and psychedelic um, music. And so I... Um, explore these traditions because it's through listening to the past and practicing and emulating other artists that I learned to I learned my form and my methodology for approaching these fields and it's also through this that I sort of start to build the first burgeonings of my own style and sound but you know, whatever. That's but that's a lot of what's going on. That's a, what what's a lot of what's behind it. And so, um, that's why I say it's for open people because most people are not going to be able to keep up with me when it comes to how many ideas I have and how much information I consume, like in a day's time, or how much of my time I spend consuming information because. 
it's not even when I'm trying to do that that I find myself doing it. And I actually have to schedule my time, make deliberate and intentional efforts to do things and to be a consistent person and not just evolve into this person who's chasing experience after experience, going down rabbit hole after rabbit hole within the library or within a Google search or within a YouTube search. And I have to stop myself from being that person. I have to put brakes on myself. I have to limit myself. I have to organize myself. It won't, it will happen no matter what. If I, if I um, become too bored in some activity, if I don't need very much attention to do that activity, I start daydreaming or I start thinking. And a lot of times it's thinking. A lot of times it's thinking. But some all other times daydreaming depends on what I'm doing. So um, and how much I've done during the day. If I've done a lot of intellectual activity, like cognitively intense activity, all throughout the day, and then I'm doing something like washing the dishes or um, cleaning something, and you know that's not very complicated. You just move your hands in a certain direction and make sure you don't drop something. It doesn't take a lot of attention. And if that's if if that has been the scenario, then a lot of what's going to start happening is more thinking. Um, if it's early, early in the morning and I for some reason don't have to be at work or, you know, sometimes I start my days late. I don't really start any day at the same exact same time in, anyways, but sometimes I start my days early. Sometimes I start my days later on in the day um, in the morning, like around 10 or 11, but I can be up anywhere from 4 a.m. to 11 a.m. It's not regular. Never will be. It just it's kind of always dependent on like what I did the previous day, which sort of unfolds in terms of how much. So did I go to did I go to work? Did I take care of the things that I need to take care of? And did I work on math? Did I work on philosophy? Did I write and did I read? If I can hit those six things, then that I accept it as a day. I just accept it. That's good enough because trying to have more regularity than that is very difficult. But if I can hit those um, criteria, then I'm golden. Um, and so that's kind of what I'm sort of what I'm trying to indicate is that you know um, there's a reality behind who's creative and why people are creative. And that one, it's not going to change no matter how much people value creativity in the um, modern landscape and so but when it comes to being maybe a novice or maybe you are already a creative professional but you don't know what to do next or you don't know uh, or you don't feel like what you're doing is really what you should be doing then um, how do you find out what that really is and I learned this from Robert Greene through reading his book Mastery. So first thing I would recommend for people to do is to pick up Robert Greene's book Mastery and read it if they haven't, if you haven't already read it. Read Robert Book's Greene Mastery if you feel so inclined and have the opportunity to because I found it very informative and transformative in my thinking about what it really means to um, acquire expertise at doing something very really because um, I had known about the research on expert performance by Kay Anders Erickson through reading The Talent Co Code by Daniel Coyle when I was um, participating as a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu athlete and a wrestler. And so I used The Talent Code and as well as the, as well as works based on different, uh, Authors like Yuri Vergashansky, Dr. Michael Yassis, and Yuri Vanderch Yuri Vanderchuk, which yes, all of these are re Russian science uh, sports scientists, but all of these things in conjunction with the talent code told me how to or gave me the blueprint for how to train as an athlete, and um, that that was. Uh, very instrumental but when I stopped being an athlete 
uh, I didn't know really how to approach something like um, learning to be something like a mathematician, for instance, because math being a mathematician is not about having a specific uh, amount of knowledge, though you will, all mathematicians have a certain amount of knowledge if they're participating in professional uh, mathematical research, or else they wouldn't be there. But being a mathematician is not specifically about having a certain amount of knowledge. Then being a mathematician is not merely about having a certain amount of experience at doing mathematics, because there are many people who spend many hours doing mathematics, and there are many people who spend many hours teaching mathematics, and there are many people who spend many hours reading or writing about mathematics. Most of them are not creative, and many of them are not involved in research. And so, when you're talking about doing mathematical research, there's such a small window or uh, like such a small target it it's not as narrow as like deciding you're going to be um, a skeet shooter or something like that but being a mathematician is a lot more narrowing of an aim than um, getting a bachelor's degree that's just a simple example because most people will never, ever, ever, ever be able to be a research mathematician with just a bachelor's degree. Now, if that's the only amount of knowledge and experience they have, most people never. Because, yeah, mathematics is sufficiently complicated and challenging. And so, so that's what I... So, what I, I suppose, because being a mathematician is such a kind of narrow goal, meaning not the, the more narrower the goal becomes, the less valid paths of entry that actually ex valid effective paths of entry. So paths that will actually hit the mark close enough to bullseye, you can set up the, the metaphor of a bullseye board and there's a certain, you have to actually get within the circle. Not on the rims or the edges of the circle, but you have to actually get within the circle. So it's not to say that you have to, um, you don't always have to have, hit, hit the mark exactly. You don't have to be ideal, but to actually get maybe from the distance you're standing across the room. So for how much knowledge it takes, how much experience it takes, um, how much practice and um, imitation, teaching, learning, intuition, reasoning, um, all such things that go into being a mathematician, from where the beginning is to where you are trying to land that dart, that's a sufficiently long distance and that target is not very large. Um, and so it's not exactly like um, impossible to stand at differing angles to the board and throw the dart and it make it down there. But if you can think about a very um, a small uh, dart board on a wall, say uh, 30 feet from a person, then whoa, we have a serious situation here. And are we actually going to be able to, I mean, if a person could theoretically like throw a dart that distance and it actually land, I'm not saying that the, the person could, but to actually hit it, man, the way you stand in your initial uh, launch of the trajectile, projectile is going to determine where it hits the board, how forcefully it hits the board, um, and what time and speed it hits the board with. And all those things matter in terms of how likely it is you're going to have a job as a research mathematician. It's not life or death or something like that, so don't freak yourself out, but it's not trivial at the same time. Um, and so that's, a, so that's the way that I would phrase it. 
because creative things are oftentimes like this, so think about being a musician. What does it mean to be a musician? So you're not going to spontaneously find people becoming musicians. Being a musician takes a lot of practice, and it takes a certain amount of knowledge. So you can either gather this knowledge from imitating other people. It's a lot easier these days because you have YouTube and you can look up scales and chords. There are a lot of tutorials and things that people are willing to teach you for free. Free, sort of. Um, and there's a lot of content that you can buy. There are much, There is a lot you can buy in music education on the internet through Amazon and um, what you can learn on YouTube um, and what you can Google. And so um, it's easier to become a musician, but the reason why there, there are probably more musicians now than there were in the past, but the reason why there aren't a thousand and one Bob Dylans is because it's very difficult to be Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan, I mean, he tells a certain narrative, but Bob Dylan had to practice a lot to be the type of musician that he is just factually scientifically he couldn't it wouldn't be some it can't be some other way um no person no person that has been measured by i guess a particular count of hours when they keep logs of journals in practice no person from bobby fisher to whomever anybody thinks is imminent um mozart bacher whoever you could think as highly imminent, there is not a less than an average of 10,000 hours, but that's an average. So it can, it's, it, it's actually, it's factually anywhere from 7,000 and 7,000. No, 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 no. For intellectual act, for intellectual activity, nobody's been able, nobody's been able to find anybody for anything that's sufficiently intellectually complicated, like playing a musical instrument, being a world, uh, being a uh, world-class chess player, um, but they see when it's talking about being a musician, it means world-class musicians. So this following violinist and people who are, um, playing, who are world-class musicians and things like that. But still to me, it's a good enough proxy to start thinking about practically what does it mean to actually do something. And so when you're thinking about, you know, um, aiming at something, aiming to become something, you have to imitate people and look at other people who have been successful. But one thing you have to know, no matter about what the successful people tell you in terms of the story of their success or what they know to pay attention to or what they feel is most relevant about the story of their success, any person who has a certain level of creative and um, intellectual, intellectual historical achievement they spent a lot of hours practicing in order for them to be able to perform and produce those works or to do those things. That's the story for everybody. There has not been anybody across human history that anybody's found up to the to this point where that's not been true. And the thing that you find most, even most, uh, most frequently is that they usually had amazing teachers as well or really amazing mentors or um, models and individuals to um, mimic or learn from. And I think that that's why I'm so good at so many things, because I think that, look, man, you know what, what I, what do I use Spotify for? I use Spotify to actually learn how to be a musician. I like to listen to music. Don't get me wrong. I like to listen to music and I enjoy listening to music. I love listening to music. But a lot of why I use Spotify is so that I can learn to be a musician because I don't have the money to be able to pay for lessons to learn how to play like Jimi Hendrix, but I can listen to Jimi Hendrix play and see what people, what solutions other people have for com coming up with trying to play like Jimi Hendrix and seeing with testing with my ear, how much does this person really sound like what I hear on um, the uh, MP3 transmission that Spotify plays or whatever, um, or the streaming of Jimi Hendrix song all along the watchtower or whatever I have to do that and then I have to sit there and listen to all along the watchtower and play and record myself and when it's not going on seeing if I actually hit it and compare it to the music 
go back and forth, go back and forth, build, 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 build up the skill, build up the skill, build up the skill until it's there, until it exists. And that's the reality. And so that's how I use it. And so, but I think that yeah, though that process takes time, I think because I'm at the place in musical history where there are so many great musicians who have already existed within folk, psychedelic, rock, blues, heavy metal, and jazz. And these are all music genres that I take from. I have just a plethora of people to choose from, um, to emulate and um, learn and take from. And I um modern classical that whole range you name it and i think that that will be an advantage to actually having the skill to perform to level and degree um that i i want to so that i can actually um produce music that people will value i want people to like my music i want people to like my mathematics and and it's so but i mean the people people who like music i want them to like music people who my music people who like mathematics i want them to like my mathematics people who like philosophy i want them to like my philosophy that's those are the people that i make things for those are the people who i have in mind in terms of my audience maybe not specifically mathematicians but mathematicians are going to like Mathematicians who like mathematics, I don't know if there really are mathematicians who don't like mathematics, but I think people who actually like these subject matters, because the thing I have is a taste and appreciation for these subject matters, I like them very much. This is the only reason why I'm, I'm practicing them this much, and that's the only way, reason I take that much attention, attention, time, care, and um, intensity and focus. This is the only reason why I give it to these things. Now, I can limit, I know what my, what I, I should pay attention to, but I had to learn what to pay attention to, to learn what to aim for. And I had to read a lot of people on how to aim. So maybe this is just going to be on how to pick a target. So um, having said all of that, let's talk about Robert Greene's work and something that Robert Greene says in Mastery is that all masters follow their proclivities. So they follow their proclivities. Proclivities are a confluence between personality, motivation, and environmental opportunities. So for instance, proclivities usually express themselves or emerge spontaneously. So an example of a proclivity in my lifetime, I've heard a lot of music because my grandmother has, I was raised by my grandmother and I was able to listen to a lot of Atlantic Records, Motown, and so, so many others. It's a lot. Um, I heard everything from Al Green to Curtis Mayfield to Gil Scott Heron to Aretha Franklin to the Gap Band and all, all lots, 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 and 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 lots of people. Um, people Isaac Hayes a lot Isaac Hayes lots lots sorry I'm just trying I'm trying to give an illustration without tr going through the list because it's just a lot it's a lot I've heard a lot of music a lot of um soul funk um psych soul psychedelic soul music and um R&B, though I don't like modern R&B. Um, <clears throat> like, R&B from the 90s to now, I can't really get with it. I mean, I like some 90s R&B songs, and I like some like R&B songs from the 2000s, like TLC and other groups like that. There's some like I really dig, but I, you know, like for most of it, I can't, I can't really get behind it. Um, not my thing. Anyways. Um, but I have an extensive experience with that kind of music. And it was when I was maybe three years old. Um, it was either on the radio or my grandmother was playing a record. 
and it was Lenny Williams, and it was Because I Love You, or Cause I Love You. It's the song Cause I Love You by Lenny Williams. Cause I Love You by Lenny Williams came on to the radio, and I couldn't help but walk right up to the thing and be really, 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 really close to um, the, the stereo. And it was the dramatic intro with the dee nee 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 and then his voice and the power that he sung with. I tried to sing like Lenny Williams. I could not because I was a kid. Like I was three. Broke my voice, basically. I don't know, like really, but I tried all the time and like I wasn't able to do it. But then, you know, I noticed that every time I would try to sing Cause I Love You, um, I would try to sing it a lot, um, but I never really could sing it. Then whenever it was like I had to sing a kid's song or I had to sing something um, like a church hymn or something like that where it's just actually like fairly simple to sing. It's not as difficult or challenging. I was a really good singer and people were like, oh my gosh, you're good at singing and stuff like that. And I didn't really care about that, but notice, well, I did, I did like it a little. I'm not going to say I didn't, but I didn't really stick with singing because like, um, well, at least like as I, for some reason, I don't know, like I didn't stick with singing. So I started singing very, very, very early, like three years old and I stopped doing it because I, well, I don't know, I didn't grow up around singers and like I had more fun listening to music than I really did have fun like trying to practice singing because I love you. Like I didn't have the, um, I didn't have so much of a drive, like I, I didn't have a rage to master singing. So like that wasn't me. Like I just had a lot of, a, I had a lot of ability and I had a very, um, I had a procl proclivity because a proclivity emerges on the encounter of a certain stimulus. It can be a certain person. It can be a certain record. It could be a certain book. It can be something, but something, once you encounter it, it elicits something in you, something in your, uh, overall makeup of persona perks the hell up. And it's noticeable because it's a little peculiar, like all the kids have to sing the songs, but not all the kids are singing them the same way, the same way you are. And not all, everybody knows certain songs, but m most people don't invent songs just randomly off the top of their head because it's a little game to them. It's just fun, you know, cause I'm sitting here in this chair. I'm not sitting out. I'm not sitting here with the, my chest all bare and it's all good and it's there. And I do, would do stuff like that. I would just make up little songs based on whatever I was doing at a particular moment in time. And that was just a little fun game to me that I would play that other kids would like or I would get made fun of for. So it was hit or miss. So because also I would get made fun of for these things, I didn't like really do them. Uh, very much once I got into like grade school because uh, I was trying to kind of protect myself and shield myself. I never really stopped doing things like that um, over time. Like for instance, I would write flows or raps in um, school, but I was making up songs before I was making up raps. Like I was making up little jingles, rhymes and tunes and things like that because you know, a lot of kids, <laughs> sorry, you know, a lot of kids, um, because, uh, you know, I don't think about these things very often, I don't reflect on this stuff very often, but I had to to get where I am now, so that's why, you know, anyways, but a lot of these kid songs, they have jingles and little rhyming schemes and patterns about everything, it doesn't matter what you're watching from Blue's Clues to, um, you can read or whatever. Everything has an intro theme song. It's something. Magic School Bus, whatever. Um, lots of Disney movies break out in <laughs> Disney movies or musicals. So I was I wasn't really into the musicals for some reason. Like for some reason, my little INTP mind, for instance, I thought the woman to what's that? Um, ah man. So I watched a few musicals. I think it was Gone with the Wind. No. Um, it may have been Gone with the Wind. I watched, I watched it and I thought the woman was beautiful, but I couldn't stand the movie. There's a few musicals I watched like that. Um, 
And the only reason I watched because the woman was beautiful. But I couldn't stand the movie, actually, because... I don't know. For some reason, I didn't like people telling stories with singing. I think I'm much more... I haven't checked out Les Mis, Les Mis, but, you know, people liked it, so maybe I can check that out and see if I still feel the same as an adult. Either way, it's getting rather long. Um, that's a proclivity, because it's something of a... It takes an elicitation, it takes some kind of encounter with something... But because yourself, from a Jungian standpoint, drew yourself to that manifestation or apparition or synchronicity or appearance, that brought forth a sort of um, unfolding engine or um, motivating drive behind your force of being in person that you may try to ignore or suppress, but truth be told, the greatest seat of your powers and what you will be able to manifest and be capable of through allowing this drive and this proclivity to express itself through you and exercise itself through your life, you won't, it won't come any other way. You will be creative only in the truest sense of your greatest creative power by following down the road of that naturally uh, momentum momentously uh, unfolding cycling of this proclivity a proclivity to do some activity will be the truth of what makes you successful at what you do 100 percent um, then um, so that's so hopefully that's a clear example of a proclivity um, so, um, I guess for instance, too, um, another example of a proclivity that I have is to think and to reason and make sense of things. So, um, whenever I was also, I think it was two years old, two or three, um, we just moved to, um, our new home and my grandfather cut the yard, the backyard. And we were walking around and I was asking him a lot of questions about why this and why that and what's this and what's that. Then I noticed we walked by dog, we had dogs and uh, we walked by dogs feces and he had to clean it up. And so he, when he got to the dog feces, he kind of got us a look on his face. He scooped it up and he, and I was holding the trash can and he dropped it in there and when like kind of dropped in, you know how the smell kind of, the, because of the vacuum within the trash can, the smell sort of drops and then explodes upwards and it, woof, like flies into your nostrils when I got a whiff of the, when I got a whiff of the uh, dog uh, shit. <laughs> I was like, oh, oh my God. She had my face grimaced too. And I was like, oh, his face grimaced and my face grimaced. And I thought, wow, so I find dog poop disgusting. He finds dog poop disgusting. And then I thought, if, People find dog poop disgusting. Does that mean dogs find people's poop disgusting? And I asked him, I said, Tommy, he was like, what? I said, if people find dog uh, poop disgusting, does that mean dogs find people's poop, poop disgusting? He just kind of looked at me like, what? And I was like, well, I said, I guess, I don't know. And that was it. But that was a great poop inquiry, is what I call it. And this is what I call that little event, is the great poop inquiry. And the great poop inquiry is another proclivity. It's something that I have a propensity towards doing, whether I want to do it or not. I am going to think about things, reason about them, and make sense of them. I have to. And then that's going to lead me to wonder and think about other things it's always never ending never ending and so that's been the case since i was two or three years old um but mm, i don't come from a family of academics i wasn't raised around philosophers and i wasn't raised by a mathematician i knew no mathematicians or anything like that growing up but that, that proclivity towards thinking is the exact reason why I'm a mathematician and a philosopher, 100%. And each of them 
um, satisfy certain, uh, what would I say, like orients or takes of thinking that I have. Same thing with literature, but you know, it's less about think, well, yeah, anyway. <laughs> Everything in my life is kind of about thinking, but it's like, I use different ways of thinking and creativity even serves as another instrument for thinking rather than like my life is very much so about being creative but even though my life is about being creative a lot of why I pursue a life devoted towards being creative is because I think a lot. So I have a lot of ideas and it kind of feels like I'm condemned to be this person. Whether I want to be this person or not, it's going to happen. So I, and I have to pick something to do with myself and I have to be successful because I want to get married and I want to have a family and things like that and living in America or the UK or whatever is not cheap. Not necessarily, not if you want to have a pretty wife and you want to have healthy kids and all this stuff like that that I value and, you know, and I want to be able to send them to school and get them teachers and help them develop their um, talents and uh, follow their proclivities and uh, things like that. So that they're also successful and things like that because I have these sorts of kinds of um, motivations or uh, drives or um, ultimate um, visions or images or realities, narratives. So there are certain narratives that are dominant to our society and across the history of our society that have impregnated my mind that I cannot wrench from the recesses and to actually try to have some other different story won't actually occur. Like I either kill, I either kill my will to be or I stick with the thing that I am. <laughs> and then it's really shitty. That <laughs> or and I, no, so like it's not really that extreme nece necessarily, but because I'm this far in the process, it's that extreme. But for human existence in general, it may not be, it doesn't work like that necessarily. So anyways, but uh, <laughs> anyways, but because I'm deposed to a certain character, but I have sort of overarching or overriding proclivities to my purse, my person or myself, my character is shaped and pulled toward a certain direction regardless if I want to go there or not like whether I want to do it or not I'm going to like <laughs> it's just gonna happen like it's gonna happen there's no free will not in that not in the way that people tend to like to think of the idea of free will there is only a way you all we all have a way of being whether we want to accept it or not and I think the greatest thing that um, eastern traditions probably give to people or help people accept is accept the um accept life accept the reality of self and being just accept it in the sense that you're like a ficus you're like an oak tree you are like a fern you are just as much a piece of nature like any other living thing out there and you will unfold as you will unfold whether you want to or not you can either work with the material you can either so for instance i view myself i've said this in other videos about create i said this in the last video about creativity so for instance i view myself as a slab of marble or stone the reason why i pick marble or stone is because there's different varieties you can have different um amounts or quantities of this marble or stone i think that maybe i'm a mountain of marble or stone and maybe it's a certain um quart or type in particular i don't know but you can have these images of yourself and that's what i beat and hammer and chisel into something because it takes a certain kind of stone and a certain amount of it and a certain sculptor to get um david from michelangelo and what your actual creative self is or what your actual intellectual creative professional self is is a Michelangelo because you're just a person. You have a certain personality and a certain set of proclivities. I mean, thinking is very general. Singing and rhyming is actually very general. Um, why? Oh, and something else. Damn it, I got to talk about it. Sorry. So, so I'm using myself as an example because it's just easy. So, um, oh no, maybe I don't need to. So 
But singing and rhyming is very general. Like it doesn't mean anything specifically. You can sing in many different、um, arenas in life. You can go sing for auto commercials if you want. You can go write jingles for kids shows. You can go write jingles for commercials. You can go write. There's a lot of things you can do with rhyming schemes. You can go be a hip hop artist. You can go be a poet. You can go a lot of things. So it's very general. Proclivities are general. They're not like super specific, but they will only express themselves. You can only exercise exercise them as intensely as maybe you are motivated or inclined to within certain domains of activity. And because that's true, you will only get a certain kind of meaning, satisfaction. Or fulfillment through expressing these proclivities within certain domains of and arenas of activity, which is why you have to identify the proclivities. You have to identify the proclivities. The proclivities for me are: I sing, I rhyme, I write, I think, I paint, I draw. I did all of these things just spontaneously at different times in my life for different reasons, but relatively early. As in responses to things, drawing and painting were a response to psychological and emotional trauma. Thinking was just something that I did. Singing and rhyming are just things that I did. I don't know why I needed psychological and emotional trauma to force me to draw and to paint, but that's what it was for me. And.、Um, Storytelling. Well, I was very good at lying to other kids on the playground.、And、I was very good at spotting a liar. So,、um, I'm good at spotting a liar, and I'm good at、um, tricking other kids. Yeah, I was good at doing that.、Um, but I wouldn't like take that too far. But I would trick other kids, like you know, because we I don't know why kids play games. Well, because you know you gotta be able to spot lies. Sometimes it is、um, strategic and sensible to deceive another person because you don't want them to know certain things about you because it would be very bad or dangerous. And so I guess that's why kids play games where they're always tricking pe- tricking one another on the playground.、Mm-hmm. But I was good at that, and、um, I really liked the Bible and I really liked reading it. And、um, After a certain point in my reading, I guess enough literature and watching enough movies and seeing enough television sh- shows like action cartoons and animes and all other sorts of things.、Um, around ten or around the ages of ten, oh, you know, I know what did it. Reading Lord of the Rings. So my、uh, friends and I read Lord of the Rings, the trilogy. In middle school, and as after that point, I started writing stories of my own. So,、um, so I have a proclivity to lie and tell stories. I have a proclivity to think about things, and I have a proclivity to rhyme and sing, and I have a proclivity to draw and depict the world in visual ways, or a sim- symbol vis. Visual symbols depict things as visual symbols. I'm very drawn to visual symbolization and symbols themselves, and so、um, those are all proclivities. Now, what does that mean? You become? I don't know, man. Like I chose the things that I chose because they appealed the most to me, given like the contemporary climate. So,、um, but I would say identify the proclivities. Usually, they have some particular genesis. Their genesis is early, or their genesis is very pronounced. It doesn't just happen.、Um, you have certain personality, and the proclivity expresses itself in certain ways. Like maybe you like me, you'll tell a lie or something like that. But it's not very obvious that that means that you're going to be a writer or something like that. Not until something inspires you or elicits it, forces it out. It draws it out, draws it forth. I don't know what else to say. Draws it forth, pulls it out. The environment, something there, calls it. You are called to your proclivity. You are called to those things. And when you find the arenas where,、um, contemporarily, they probably they might have the most meaning and salience as it pertains to you and what you value, then you will feel like you have a vocation 
as a person, perhaps a destiny, if you really are like the kind of personality that believes in those things and thinks about those things. I do live life as if I have a certain destiny, but do I believe in destinies in some kind of specific sense? No, not really. I think all of this stuff can be explained by um, personality, neuroscience, cognitive science, evolution, and all sorts of things. But the narrative makes sense because human beings are narrativistic creatures and we need them in order to help us think and grow and learn in life. And so that's why I tell it this way. But um, find the proclivities, bear them out. Um, and once they're going to be very general and they're going to have particular genesis that cannot be ignored. Um, I think most people who have parents, parents, good parents will notice these things about their kids and help them out. Or kids can add, or kids when they're in the right environment and they understand what they're actually um, in, in, inclined to do and they can assess their own wants and needs, might also be able to advocate for themselves better and uh, tell their parents what they want to do. But kind of for um, many different reasons, I had many more things to think about and focus on um, or I felt um, belabored by like by abandonment issues and all of the sorts of things that um, I couldn't really like look at my proclivities and think that they meant something um, about me in a good useful valuable sort of way um, it took me a long time to look at myself neutrally and then it took me an even longer time to um, start to see what is valuable about myself. It was all a process. So mm, that's what I would say. Um, but I think that this pattern is pretty much going to um, be what it is for all people. Though the, the latency and the time with which these things happen for each person and under what settings is very variable. But they all have this quality of... It's not, it's not, um, it's not what you want, it's what you are, and how what you are leads to what you're motivated to do, and what, sh in the ways you're motivated to be, which will ultimately be the fuel that you use to be the motivation for what you become. Um, fuel and the capacity, the fuel and the capacity. The proclivities provide the fuel and the capacity. Um, along with deliberate practice, but we'll get all to all that stuff some other time. So that's we're in this part. We're figuring out how to aim, and so map out those proclivities. Um, good luck and happy hunting.